Okay, I think we're gonna get started. All right, good evening, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to direct you to um, our Padlet link listed on the description on our YouTube channel. So if you could please take a second and open that link up so that if you have any questions, they can be included in our question and answer portion of the evening. So my name is Michelle Messer and on behalf of the Haddon Township Equity Initiative, I wanna welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight. Simply stated, our mission at HTEI is learn something, do something. No matter what your beliefs may be, thinking about our own thinking can create opportunities for understanding and by extension, connection. Many moved to this town because they wanted neighbors, knowing that we can't go at this alone. People want connection. And after learning about tribalism tonight, I hope that community means opening up and not closing in. We are lucky to have people mm -hmm. among us with wisdom to share. I am so excited to introduce to you Dr. Brent Satterley. For many of us, we know him as a Halloween hero who opens his home to people far and wide on Halloween night. We plan our night around when we will land at the Halloween house, and then we go back again and again and again. Without asking for anything in return, Dr. Satterley brings joy to our town and with that community. But there's so much more. Dr. Satterley is a professor of social work at Widener University Center for Social Work Education. He is an accomplished author and nationally sought after speaker. His list of accomplishments and honors are long. Needless to say, he's a very busy man. And yet he is here with us tonight. Dr. Satterley lives his life in the service of others. So without further ado, Dr. Brett Satterley. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Dr. Brent Satterley, and uh, I can hear the applause in the background. Uh, I will tell you, um, I, uh, I love uh, living here in Haddon Township and uh, the joy that I get from uh, my, my community, my neighbors, and, and our little towns uh, and the surrounding towns is, is uh, amazing. So, so what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, I, I am a, a professor at Wider University, as Michelle said, and, uh, and one of the things, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, schools are trying to figure out how to teach and how to uh, continue to try to do our hard work. And as a teacher, uh, it's actually one of the uh, ways that uh, my... I, I'm, I'm very much someone who thrives and feeds off of an audience. So uh, I will do my best, uh, as I said, uh, to uh, continue to teach online. Um, my, uh, you know, it, they say I, I have a, a certain degree of narcissism, as they say. My therapist says that being a teacher is a wonderful job for me because it's a way to get my narcissistic needs met in an appropriate manner. Ha ha ha. Uh, regardless, uh, I'm really here to be here. Uh, glad to be here. Here tonight, and we are going to talk about uh, something that is really important. Uh, and I'm just going to get us started uh, because we only have a limited amount of time. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, I'm going to kind of move us along, and we're going to talk about uh, sick of us uh, versus them, uh, the dangers of tribalism. That is pathological tribalism and our community, uh, and uh, it is a huge uh, part of. Of what is currently happening now uh, on the national landscape. I don't have to tell you that you simply can walk out your door uh, or click on a phone or look at a screen and uh, see all kinds of examples of how communities are being torn apart, families are being torn apart uh, by uh, what I would frame as pathological tribalism based on the work of Dr. Kevin De La Plante, uh, when I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanna thank the Haddon Township Equity Initiative for the hard work, Michelle and a really hard uh, group of working folks. Um, so I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here. I also wanna thank um, the superintendent of the Haddon, uh, Haddon Township School District and the Haddon Township School District itself for uh, supporting uh, this uh, opportunity. All right, so um, 
Research says that students and participants of any kind of training like to know what's coming next. So we're going to start with looking at the agenda. Uh, just a quick welcome and check in and looking at what is tribalism, how we understand it, what does it mean, what does it look like, but what then is pathological tribalism and how is it different from tribalism? What are subsequently the effects of it and then how tribalism impacts families and communities itself, followed by some takeaways and closing. You can see the objectives there. Uh, I am an educator so I want to make sure that we can absolutely uh, see where we're going. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, with anything, uh, whenever talking about sensitive topics um, that are personal, that are public and conversely private at the same time, uh, we have a tendency to have strong beliefs about those kinds of topics. Uh, and, uh, and what ends up happening is that people have a hard time I often call it uh, playing well in the sandbox with others, if you will. Uh, and that's a really important piece. So starting with uh, the conversations uh, that, that we're gonna be having later on after my presentation um, uh, is that I often will turn to uh, some of our wonderful kindergarten teachers for some of the best guidelines ever for adults. Uh, that is we want to, and this is taken directly from kindergarten classrooms, help each other, clean up after yourself, use kind words, treat others kindly, do the right thing, share everything, tell the truth, never give up, do your best always, ask a lot of questions, say please and thank you, work hard, play fair, and don't whine. Uh, I think if we were able to abide by these, the world might be a better place. So keep those in mind. All right, so we're going to start with what is your tribe? Um, uh, and oftentimes people are like, well, what's a tribe? Well, um, Dr. De La Plante, uh defines a tribe in many ways as a sense of human groupishness. Basically, that means we like to uh, gather in groups. Humans are social creatures, which in many ways is particularly difficult, as you all know, I'm sure, in light of the fact that we're facing a pandemic right now. And one of the things that is uh, significantly challenging is we long for connection. Uh, and when we experience isolation for too long, we often get up here in our heads, we often get really involved in our screens uh, and uh, end up having uh, some uh, challenging times. Um, uh, and and we'll, I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But to start with, what's a tribe? So what's your favorite sports team? Well, I'm sure that this group's favorite sports team, football in particular, is the Dallas Cowboys. I am sure of it. Uh, Oh, wait, no. Oh, yeah, the Eagles, the Eagles, uh, actually. And it, it, and the tri uh, the Eagles tribe um, can be classified in lots of different things. Are you a super fan? Are you just a fan? Are you a non-fan? Are you an anti-fan? You're not interested? Whatever. However you frame it and understand it, that is in and of itself is a tribe. And I will just say, for those of you who are super fans, I did actually have an Eagles Super Bowl ring in my house. Yes, I did. Um, uh, so I won't tell you how that happened. It was all legit, though, uh, which is pretty exciting. So we're all part of a tribe. Now, obviously, it's just not um, only, uh, you know, uh, sports ball. Oh, sorry. Uh, basket, baseball. What, what is that? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not just sports. It's other things. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, it can be faith communities, it can be neighborhood associations, it can be groups like the Haddon Township Equity Initiative. It can also be your family, uh, your small nuclear family with whom you live. Uh, it can be your extended family. Uh, it can be um, your, uh, you know, the, if you're a part of a particular fandom like Star Wars or Star Trek. Uh, and if you say you don't know what those are, uh, I'm gonna have an issue. Uh, uh, regardless, uh, and then it's a big part of that. Tribes are really important. Tribes in and of themselves are not a bad thing. And of course, one of the things that we can certainly highlight right now is the unique and distinctive political tribes that exist nationally and internationally uh, in our experience. We could say that being an American is a tribe, but also being a Republican and being a Democrat is a tribe, being a libertarian and independent is a tribe, being Green Party is a tribe. All of those pieces are really important to recognize that those tribes exist. And typically those tribes have with them cultural norms, 
unspoken expectations and guidelines about how people are supposed to behave and more to the point what they're supposed to believe and this is often very loosely fitting like uh, a gentle cloak uh, it's not too constricting or too tight in that respect all right we're going to come back to that so a big part of this particular uh, presentation is about knowing yourself. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a social worker, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm also a professor and educator uh, and a family therapist. And one of the biggest parts of my work in education and in therapy is helping clients and students get to know who they are. And you might say, well, that's really easy. Well, actually it's really not uh, because we are as humans, complicated and sometimes contradictory creatures uh, and that we can uh, act and behave in lots of different ways. So for example, um, we'll say, we know that knowledge doesn't always influence behavior, right? And if I were in a classroom right now, I would say, how many people here have ever exceeded the speed limit in Haddon Township? And my guess is all of you would be raising your hands. Uh, and yet, uh, what do we know that exceeding the speed limit can do? How is it dangerous? Well, yeah, it's dangerous. People can uh, get a ticket. People can get in a car crash. People can uh, actually kill or hurt someone else or yourself, right? It's really dangerous. And yet, um, my guess is that even though now that you know this information, you'll still do it. You'll still exceed the speed limit. And the question is why? Um, there are lots of different reasons for that. One of those has to do with uh, Dr. David Elkind's um, you know, personal fable. The idea is this will never happen to me. I'll never get in a car accident, all those kinds of things. And that applies to other kinds of potential consequences that our frontal lobe weighs when we think. That's the front part of the brain that measures reason uh, in that experience. Now, people will often say, well, it's those adolescents. It's those kids today, you know, with their rock and roll and drugs and all all of that, uh, or their bicycle gangs, uh, I will say to you um, that uh, often adolescents think with a part of their brain because their brains are still growing called the amygdala. That is the part of the brain that's kind of like Cookie Monster. Mine, mine, mine. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Ah, rah, rah, right? It's all I want now what I want it now. Uh, and so what often happens for adolescents when they do something at high risk behavior, um, like exceeded the speed limit, will say, what were you thinking? And the reality of it is they weren't. Uh, they weren't thinking. They weren't measuring the consequences like those of us who have developed, fully developed brains can do and say, oh, if I do this, it could be risky. The challenge is, why don't we do that kind of reasonable weighing of consequences or out potential outcomes, positive or negative, when we engage in a behavior? It's because knowledge doesn't always influence a behavior, all right? And that's an important piece to remember, know thyself. And that brings us to thinking about your lived experience. Uh, and uh, that's an important component here, uh, thinking about where you were born, what generation were you born into? Are you from the silent generation? Are you a baby boomer? Are you a Gen Xer? Yay! Are you a millennial? Are you a Zoomer or a Z generation? Um, all of those different generational aspects often will let give people a lens through which that they view the world. That's one form of a lived experience. Experience. And tonight we're going to look at our lenses. This is a lovely, just kind of a lens through which we see the world. And you'll notice here it has an ending. Uh, and part of tonight's um, presentation is going to try to help you recognize where your lens ends and how to look on the other side of it. Uh, and that's a big part of critical thinking, which is going to be the magic word for tonight. So where did, where did your parents grow up? Your grandparents, or your great grandparents. Often the region that you grew up in has lots of cultural scripts that impact how you view the world. What you think of as right and wrong, which we'll talk about in a minute. What's your earliest memory, earliest school memory? Uh, what kind of events did you celebrate as a family? Uh, go on uh, childhood uh, vacations uh, or things like that. Have you traveled or moved as a kid? Uh, what about as an adult? Think about an international event that occurred before you turned 18. What was involved? Who was there? I know I could think of the fall of the Berlin Wall, those kinds of things. 
um, uh, from a national event, I can also think of like when we ask people questions, do you remember where you were when? Things like uh, when Kennedy was assassinated, uh, when the Challenger exploded, uh, certainly when 9-11 occurred. Uh, that's one of the reasons because uh, those things imprint on certain parts of our brain. Uh, and, uh, and that's a significant part. And you'll say, well, what, what's he talking so much about the brain? It's because what's between your ears is the most important organ in your body in that regard, because it helps shape how you perceive uh, different phenomena. And that's gonna come back to the whole us versus them experience. Uh, and then what's your earliest re recollection as a member of a group? Maybe it was in a class, maybe a sports team, maybe a, a Girl Scouts or Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts or 4-H or or who knows what, uh, maybe in the choir or the band, um, uh, acting experience, uh, what was your first job? And as an adult, what events did you celebrate? Think about some of these things uh, in that experience. And that brings us to considering your values. Now, values are a hotbed, uh, and often uh, people often think of them in uh, very specific ways. Um, people will, may have heard the words family values, and that can invoke what uh, George Lakoff would call a frame in your mind for understanding that this is what uh, family values means. And then we have like a box and what is included in there. And for many people, it might be, you know, um, mom, dad, 2.5 kids, a dog, uh, you know, a cat uh, yeah, and a white picket fence, the whole kind of thing. People have that frame in their mind. Uh, and that frame is in and of itself biased simply because all families don't look like that. Uh, all families, lots of different types of families, single parent families, LGBTQ families, um, uh, families of color, families uh, where someone has a, an emotional, mental, or physical disability, uh, families of different religions, etc. Lots of different aspects of diversity. The kicker is we see our values through this lens. Like these are our values. This is how we view the world between what's right and what's wrong. And what often happens is people see their values as, if you will, an infant. Uh, humans are very protective of their children. Uh, and I feel like Star Trek, right? Uh, and humans are very protective of their children. And uh, often in an infant, with an infant, we will hold an infant and we'll coo at it and nurture it. And if you think about your values like this infant, you will nurture your values, you will safeguard your values. And what do you do if somebody tries to protect or go after your infant? Somebody goes after your kid. Oh, mama bear comes out, right? You'll either run or attack. Uh, and we have what's called the uh, fight or flight reaction. Um, and that's typically often what is considered a trauma-based reaction when people experience some kind of trauma. If a bear's running at you, you'll either fight or flight, right? You'll either run like the bugger to get out of there, or you'll try to fight it. Now, hopefully you don't try to fight it. Um, uh, but uh, we know that that's an important thing. In addition, other trauma-based reactions are freeze, where people will just have a hard time processing cognitively and emotionally, uh, or they will engage in what's called fauna. That is, they will people please. No, everything is fine. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm so sorry. Like what we can, would consider like codependent reaction where other people's needs come before your own in that sense. And you may be like, well, okay, we got values, Dr. Brown. Okay, got it. So <clears throat> do you believe in gun control? What does that look like for you? How would it be implemented? Do you think abortion is an, as a contraception is acceptable or unacceptable? Why or why not? Do you believe healthcare is a right? Do you believe that a baker should be able to refuse to make a wedding cake for a gay couple? Do you think we should build the wall? Uh, should, do you believe that Black Lives Matter? Do you think teachers should be armed in school? Do you believe uh, you should address it when someone makes a racist statement? Do you believe high school students should be able to take a same-sex date to the prom? Uh, do you believe that burning the flag is wrong? Do you believe that transgender ban in the military is discriminatory? Do you think a national mask mandate is a good idea? Do you think college education should be free? Oh, these are some hot button issues in our society, in our cultures. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of what your values reflect. And I want you to go back to the previous slide and think about how did where you grew up, 
the messages you learned about what's right and wrong and the cultural scripts, as we call them, uh, impact what you believe about these hot button issues. Oftentimes these hot button issues will very quickly have a powerful experience and have a highly reactive experience. Dewey, who's an educational philosopher says experience for experience sake um, doesn't lead to learning. It's experience plus reflective processing. That is how people make meaning and understand it in their world uh, in that experience. What would it be like to discuss those hot button issues in this group? Uh, what do you think would happen? How do you think people would respond? Do you think people, what kind of language would people use? Uh, would people get red in the face? Would people avert their eyes uh, in that experience? What would it be like if I asked you to identify some of your values in front of others? Some of you would have been like, absolutely, no problem. I will absolutely. And others of you would be like, no, I'm not saying a word. I don't want to get into it. I'm exhausted by it. As it is, I have to take a break from social media and I can't even watch the news anymore without having an anxiety attack. Uh, so those kinds of things. Were there any of the questions that I just asked like confusing for you. You're not sure where you stand uh, or maybe you are sure where you stand and you don't want to say because you know it's going to upset someone in your tribe and that could be in your community, in your family, in your faith community, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think then it means about your beliefs in culture war issues? Uh, and uh, that is it okay to believe uh, that uh, black lives matter or all lives matter or what do those things mean and how do they come in conflict and does one conflate over the other and all those kinds of things. Those are scary, scary questions for people to ask and yet people are grappling with those every day. They're just often not talking about it. Often what's happening is they're reacting to it. Um, <clears throat> what do you think such a conversation might look like with people in your life? Would they be uh, conversations where there's deep breaths and patience? Would there be, uh, you know, attacks, etc.? cetera? Uh, what might such a conversation say about our community? Could we as a community have some of these discussions without attacking each other? Uh, and uh, that experience, <clears throat> oops, and uh, we're being recorded. <laughs> um, what impact might this have on civil and respectful relationships? Uh, civility cannot be under, uh, underscored as something really important in how people can have uh, conversations and try to do perspective taking and understand where another person is coming from. What implications might these present for minorities in our community? Uh, I can tell you that one of the things that happens for folks who are often minorities, be uh, they um, uh, racial or ethnic minorities, be uh, people with disabilities, be um, you know LGBTQ folks, is often they live an experience of their lives where they encounter oppression in often small and sometimes big ways on a daily basis. And that can cause a lot of emotional distress. Uh, and so that might have a different impact from folks uh, who are not a member of those communities and how might you subsequently use this particular learning. Uh, so that's these are questions that I want you to think about as I am going through uh, the model on pathological tribalism. Okay, we're going to jump into it. So tribalism, this is based on the work of cognitive psychologist Kevin De La Plante. Uh, I am not a cognitive psychologist to be completely transparent. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a professor of social work uh, and uh, you know have uh, 25 plus years of training and experience, uh, you know, so say my student loans. Uh, and so that's a big part of this. So tribalism, we're not going to watch this video, but I wanted to let you know that Dr. De La Plente has a series of videos. Uh, I don't benefit from them. I don't get any money from it, this or anything at all. Uh, and I think it's just great, uh, you know, if you want to explore this further, this is just really the beginning of this. So you can launch into some of uh, Dr. De La Plente, uh, work and explore that uh, in the experience. All right, so it brings us back to the culture wars. 
uh, which are raging right now, uh, you know, just a few weeks before election 2020. Uh, gun control, Second Amendment rights, school shootings, arming teachers, immigration, the wall separating kids from families, taking American jobs, LGBTQ issues, marriage equality, transgender ban in the military, hate crimes, racism, police shootings of unarmed African Americans, Black Lives Matter protests, healthcare, having to choose between meds and food, which no one should ever have to do, uh, in my humble opinion, unable to afford insurance, Medicare for all, employment, lack of good paying jobs, immigrants stealing jobs, manufacturing jobs drying up, student loan debt, cost of education, inability to afford to buy a home, lifelong debt, reproductive rights, access to contra technology, pharmacists refusing to provide emergency contraception, protesters at abortion clinics. These various culture wars each of those sentences I just read reflect a wide variety of different ideological perspectives, different beliefs, different values about those culture war topics. Uh, and so some may say, well, immigrants aren't stealing jobs where others might say, well, they're sending them all overseas or so those are different perspectives here. So I am not endorsing them, I'm just presenting them. And that brings us to a couple of phenomena that I wanna highlight that might give you some clinical, uh, excuse me, critical thinking tools uh, here that might be helpful. And the first is what we call cognitive biases. It's a two movie phenomena. Uh, how many folks here have ever gone into a movie with someone and come out and say, what'd you think? And they're like, oh, I hated it. And you're like, really? I loved it. You know, I hated the plot. The characters were shallow. Oh my gosh, I thought that the makeup was fantastic. That plot twist was totally caught me off guard. It was compelling. Two completely different perspectives. That's what happens often when people from different tribes experience the same thing, especially a cultural event. And just such a certainly a contemporary example could be the recent uh, confirmation hearings regarding Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Ford's testimony. Uh, people watched that experience, those testimonies, and came away with completely different stories. And that just doesn't come out of nowhere that comes from a series of different cognitive biases. And the first is called affect bias. Affect is a nice PhD word for feelings or emotions. Um, that is feelings drive how we judge a thing. What you think about a thing impact, or excuse me, what you feel about a thing impacts what you think about a thing. If you feel like something is good, you generally will dismiss the negatives about it and highlight the positives. But if you feel negative about something, you don't like something, you think something's bad, you'll judge the negatives really high and the positives really low. Um, the way you feel about a thing affects the way you think about a thing. And that's a background that comes from somewhere. Often it can come back to our experience of values, but often also the experience of what we feel like our tribe wants us to believe. Uh, and that short circuits what we call critical thinking. We'll get more to that. Here's the next part though. If you can manipulate people's feelings about something, you can manipulate their thoughts about it. Politics and marketing is all about this. If you think about various commercials, uh, I don't know about some of you, but some of those uh, cotton commercials or the Folgers commercials that they show during the holidays always make me tear up. Oh my gosh, you know, they're kind of, it's all manipulating feelings uh, in this way, um, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And it uh, either can tug at positive things like nostalgia uh, or it can tug at heart wrenching things like being separated from a loved one uh, or something like that. And as a result, those kinds of manipulative forces can shape people's values and beliefs about the culture wars. If they feel like something is a threat, then they're going to often will judge it negatively. If they feel like something is a positive, like good, then they're going to judge it highly. The positives will be really positive in that respect. Affect bias, how we feel about something. Second is what we call cultural cognition. It's a second cognitive bias. Uh, and it's uh, the way our cultural values dictate what we think is right and the right way that we should organize our society as a result will drive our judgments about certain culturally polarized issue. That's just not right. It's just not right to burn the American flag. Right. And that could be a value based on your own values. And other people will say 
the, the First Amendment right and the right to express yourself is more important uh, than, uh, burning, than burning the American flag. Uh, and so there's a process of elimination there about which one of these is more important uh, in, in that regard. Um, it's really the tendency for people to form perceptions of risk and related facts that align with their own self-defining values. In other words, I come from this perspective and I'm going to try to fit the way I see things through my lens into my understanding of what is culturally right about our society. Uh, and it, that's an important component here. And then these things get entangled with culture wars, social issues, abortion, climate change, gun control, immigration, uh, uh, defund the police, all that stuff. And it blows up uh, significantly. Now, just these, these two cognitive biases, affect bias and cultural cognition alone, aren't enough to make people fall into what we call pathological tribalism. The primary ingredient is polarization. That is, we live and work and function all the time, all day long in an increasingly polarized environment. Um, so as polarization increases, that is, we're on polar opposites of the spectrum, ideologically, politically, uh, you know, uh, socially, what have you, as people separate in that respect, common ground between them decreases. Uh, so people may have thought that they can hardly have phone conversations with people in their families who come from very different political perspectives. So somebody who's voting for Biden or somebody who's voting for Trump, uh, just to use, I don't know, an example I pull out of the air, uh, might be difficult uh, to have conversations about politics because of where people stand uh, on those particular political beliefs. What we know then is in group solidarity, when we are in our our echo chambers on uh, the Book of Face or Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat or whatever, or even in personal engagements, a clique of friends, a book club, a faith community, uh, a civic organization, we're in an echo chamber often where other of people where other people who think like us. In group solidarity feeds out group animosity. That is, we resent people for not thinking like us, right? Remember, this is also affect bias, cultural cognition, and polarized environment. And this is what it often looks like with regard to a polarization. Our blessed homeland, our glorious leader, our great religion, our noble populace, our heroic adventurers. But they are there, the barbarous waste, their wicked despot, their primitive superstition, their backward savages, their brutish invaders. Uh, and we can easily see this in what we would frame as the red and blue of the United States of America uh, right now. The problem, however, folks, it's not tribalism. It's not belonging to a group. We need tribes. Again, human groupishness, we need to belong. It's tribalism plus cognitive biases plus polarization in a polarized environment equals pathological tribalism. And this is where we end up with polarization higher and higher uh, moves us into the danger zone where we don't think about other people's perspectives. We don't think about other ways that people might see things differently than we do. And there might be very real reasons why that's the case. I will tell you that um, people will do just about anything to avoid feeling a certain feeling. A lesson taught to me by uh, my father, marriage and family therapist, Lamont Satterley. Uh, and one of the things I've seen in my many years of clinical work is people will often deceive themselves. They will lie, they will cheat, they will steal, they will engage in behavior they never thought they would in order to avoid a certain feeling. And oftentimes that certain feeling that people will say is anger on the surface. Anger is a surface emotion, legit totally legit. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people should be angry and rageful in their world. But often what's underneath it is uh, something much deeper, and that's hurt or pain. Uh, and often what happens with pathological tribalism is we see lots of people who don't think like us as a threat, and then people become defensive and reaction. And when that happens, we don't often engage in critical thinking. 
and it leads to some really terrible effects of pathological tribalism. Here's an example. <clears throat> um, one is called, this is a lovely doctoral academic speak word called reactive devaluation. Basically, it's once we discover it was the other side who said it or support something, we withdraw or withhold our support, period. And uh, a, a great example was uh, a number of years ago, a high school valedictorian at a graduation uh, quoted a beloved political figure and said, don't just get involved, fight for your seat at the table, better yet, fight for a seat at the head of the table, uh, said by, uh, by uh, Donald Trump. And people, yeah! And then the high school valedictorian in a very adolescent move uh, said, oh, wait, I'm wrong. That was President Barack Obama. And people were like, <gasps> so, and they immediately withdrew the support. Now, granted, that's not just a Trump Obama thing. That's a any side of the political aisle thing if we're going to talk about politics. But it's not just about politics, about beliefs. It's about values. Once we discover it was the other side who said or support something, we don't even consider what the arguments might be in terms of exploring it. And when we start to shut down and engage in reactive devaluation, um, then we don't have a, any kind of opportunity for opening our minds and seeing something differently. One of my favorite um, definitions of open-mindedness was in the documentary called uh, talking about, uh, it's elementary, talking about gay issues in schools. And one of the uh, kids, a young kid in like third grade was asked, what do you think about uh, open-mindedness? What's the definition of that? And this little kid just said, um, it's kind of like if you haven't ever tried broccoli, like you could try broccoli, you might like it, right? Best definition of open-mindedness ever. I really love it. So the second effect I wanna highlight is something called crystallization. Basically, we freeze people in time or their narratives. We freeze people in time. Uh, and this is particularly significant because kids and adolescents, remember their brains are still developing, uh, just an FYI, as an aside, neurobiologically, our brains are still developing into what we call adult adolescence. That is into probably up to 25. Uh, the neural pathways in our brains are still developing and uh, growing over time. So. Um, and so in, even when we're talking about children and adolescents, we're even talking about folks who are 22 plus. Uh, and, uh, you know, so basically they're less likely to have formed crystallized uh, political and socialized identities. But what often happens is people will have a negative experience of someone and then freeze that person in time and prohibit them from ever being able to grow or change or generalizing entire belief systems or generalizing entire uh, messages or beliefs about that particular group of which that person is a representative. Great example. Anybody here ever have someone who behaved badly at a holiday gathering that time 10 years ago that Uncle Vinny got drunk at Christmas dinner and told mom that she was a horrible mother and turned him into a drunk and they haven't spoken since, even though he's been sober for five years. Um, so my guess is if you were to think about your family, uh, that you could probably think of individuals that have been frozen in time and that they could never grow a change. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be angry about bad behavior, um, but it is possible for people to grow and change over time. Uh, and that's an important recognition of pathological tribalism is it doesn't let people grow and change over time. They're all bad. And people who represent that group are all bad. That tribe are all bad. And of course, we've seen that in the sweeping generalizations. So all you have to do is look on Facebook, or even more horrifically, on any kind of comment section of a news story online, uh, the, often the comments are really vitriolic and nasty uh, and uh, incredibly pathologically tribalized. Thirdly, the concept of othering as developed by Michelle Fine. She was a qualitative anthropologist. She did a lot of great work with high school dropouts. Uh, and uh, she basically looked at the practice of embracing an identity for oneself that's based on the creation and the maintenance of the other. Lovely conversation. It's basically an us versus them. That's one of the things that most people are often really sick of uh, is that there's just an us versus them. And uh, it is a group of folks who are different from us a lot and it allows us 
to rationalize being right. That this viewpoint is the right viewpoint. This belief is the right belief. This relationship and the way it looks is the right way. This tribe is the right tribe. I grew up in a small town, uh, north central Pennsylvania called Wellsboro. Beautiful little town, main street, gas lights, you know, uh, apple pie parades, all kinds of things. Uh, farm country, beautiful country, uh, you know, really uh, salt of the earth folks. And uh, one of the things that sometimes happened, and, uh, happened uh, when I was growing up is we got a sense of who the bad folks were in the world and they were flatlanders now my jersey folks will be like who in the world are flatlanders uh and well flatlanders are basically people who live below i'm talking about i lived in uh north central pennsylvania right probably about four and a half hours north uh from philly uh, and, uh, you know, an hour north of Williamsport, for those of you who, who know about it, the home of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. Uh, but Flatlanders were folks who lived below the Lehigh Tunnel, uh, who didn't live in the mountains, who are all the cause of all our sorrow, all the cause of all our troubles, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that was one of the easy ways that we othered people who were different uh, from us, something as simple as that. In this case, we could easily say, you know, for those of us who live in Haddon Township, it's obviously those people who live in Haddonfield. They are the cause of all our problems. <laughs> Just kidding. Love you, Haddonfield. All right. So um, what does this do to families? Well, folks, it can tear people apart. Um, we look at historical conflict and how pathological tribalism influences families. Now, we know there are lots of reasons families end up having conflict. Um, you know, uh, throughout uh, as kids age, uh, you know, difficult childhood environments, destructive parenting, uh, contentious sibling rivalries, mental illness, addiction, uh, general uh, life problems, employment, poverty, personality conflicts. Um, typically, often animosity can already exist in families itself. Um, you know, maybe Aunt Susie doesn't like the way that. Um, Uncle Jim spoke to her years ago, and that's just been a story of contention. Oftentimes, I'll tell you that a lot of people who don't even remember what it is that caused some of the difficulties. Uh, and then you add to it pathological tribalism. So you've got this historical conflict, like a foundation, and you add to it the seeds of pathological tribalism that are influenced by persuasion technologies, the stuff that, you know, the stuff we get on, you know, do you listen to NPR or Fox News, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or somewhere in between. Uh, and, uh, you know, do you, what are the, some of the persuasion campaigns, geopolitics, um, people certainly have heard of the uh, potential influence of uh, international governments influencing, uh, you know, social media, um, the role of marketing, commerce, advertising, the fact that we can connect with people 24-7 and the role that digital media plays end up feeding the tribal psychology and the polarization, which makes families often explode. And what often happens is people cut off from each other. Family therapist Bowen describes the emotional cutoff as the severing of relationships emotionally with other people. This might also mean physically, uh, you know, relationally, time-wise, um, you know, it's the, the infamous blocking of people on social media, all that kind of stuff um, can be extraordinarily painful. Uh, and uh, again, a lot of people don't often know why that's the case. Uh, and then what ends up happening is that folks who leave that particular tribe find a tribe that reminds them of their own beliefs and values, their own lenses. And it is a relief. It's like, oh gosh, yes, because people want to be heard, they want to be known, and they want to be understood. Like that's a lot of what it comes down to. That's a lot of what social work is, frankly, folks. Uh, that is, they want to be heard, seen, and known. And often these echo chambers give people that. The challenge is it cuts off critical thinking. In the short term, it can contribute to uh, a, um, a projection or an externalization, if you will, of evil of nastiness. Uh, it can resolve easy doubts uh, about and give you black and white or dichotomous thinking. This is right and this is wrong. This is black and this is white. Uh, um, this is ethical, this is non-ethical. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it helps actually to facilitate what we call fanaticism. People get into a tribe, a pathological tribe, and there are often sometimes even cult-like uh, characteristics that people can ascribe to that this is the and only way uh, that is right and correct in being. And, and it can lead to a degree of elation and fervor and then nastiness and lashing out at the other, uh, coupled with a sense of confusion and numbness later on when either people are on the receiving end of that projection of nastiness or judgment or people who have left the family end up finding themselves feeling pretty lonely if they feel like their new tribe doesn't fit the same way that they thought it would. And it can lead to a sense of numbness, even some difficulties emotionally with uh, mental health. In the long term, and this is really one of the things that we often have seen in individuals, it can uh, lead to people only paying attention to certain messages, like what we call selective perceptual inattention, that is only picking when you hear something on TV and you're like, yes, absolutely, that's it. And then you don't listen to anything else, right? That, uh, or um, it can lead to a sense of dissociation within yourself. You almost split parts of yourself. Well, here I'm this and there I'm this, uh, which is exhausting by the way. Uh, it can lead to a sense of guilt and restricting um, a sense of authenticity that you can't really be your real self all the time. Uh, and that's rough. In families, it can lead to secrets people not sharing things, people hiding things from each other. It can lead to a conspiracy of silence. We all know we're not supposed to talk about this. How many folks have been at a dinner table they'll be like, no, talk about politics, religion, or anything like that, uh, but it's okay to talk about X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, family isolation uh, and intergenerational and transgenerational splits, uh, which can be extremely painful for many families. I can tell you as a family therapist, I've seen many families where this kind of emotional cutoff uh, has, has left people without connection for decades. Uh, and it's it's heart wrenching, uh, and ultimately in communities. If you think just just stops in your home, you're <laughs> nope. It happens uh, with polarization, uh, people not talking to each other, um, a sense of giving up or submission. Whatever you think, it's fine. Scapegoating, violence. Uh, you know, uh, you know, blaming other people for your rough feelings, your bad feelings, uh, or even acting out in violent ways, taking other people's signs from their lawn, or uh, even uh, more absence thing, like in some cases, I've had wonderful neighbors on my street who on occasion uh, will just bring my garbage can, empty garbage can after the, uh, the trash folks come uh, and uh, up off the si uh, onto the sidewalk or up near my house. Uh, and people will stop doing things like that for each other uh, in a way that is, leads to a lot of isolation. So what I'd like for you to do is, I know you, you have Padlet to be able to access some of this, is reflect on an experience of your family. Ever had a family conversation like this? I know I have, uh, even when things flew across the table. Um, and uh, where your family might reflect some of the pathological tribe effects, like reactive devaluation, crystallization, or othering. Remember, reactive devaluation is that you withdraw your support from a thing when you find out the other side supports it or says it. Crystallizing is freezing people or their stories, narratives in time. And othering is the us versus them. Like they're not me. Like that's not me um, in that experience. So what happened? What was the outcome of such a conflict? Uh, did people leave with hurt feelings? Whereas their um, name calling? God forbid, was there violence beyond emotional or verbal violence? Uh, you know, was there anything of that nature? And uh, how would you resolve it? What would you like to see happen? Is that reasonable? How can people try to be seen and known and understood in ways? I wanna be clear. People's values are what they are for a reason. People just don't wake up one day and say, oh, you know, I'm gonna steal a car. Right? I'm going to steal a car. No, there's a whole lived experience, cultural upbringing, cultural scripts, values, experiences, good and bad, that lead people to say, today, I'm going to commit a crime. 
Uh, it's not something that's because human beings are complicated and sometimes contradictory, right? Knowledge doesn't always influence behavior. Just we know because we know a crime is a bad thing to do and the consequences could be dire, we might still do it anyway because we think we absolutely have to or we need to or nothing bad is really going to happen. That personal fable that I talked about earlier. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges here. People have a right to their values and belief systems, um, even if it doesn't fit in with their family's values and belief systems. Now, some of those values and belief systems might be offensive to other people. Uh, and the interesting part about First Amendment is that you can, uh, in the United States anyway, have free speech and speak your values. Uh, and uh, the challenge is, is that you also have to accept responsibility for what it is that you say and do. Uh, and that's a big part of it. Same thing happens here on a family level uh, with how people might resolve it. I will uh, say that, um, you know, there's a concept of uh, mo lots of models out there on forgiveness. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that is really hard for people, believe it or not, it takes a lot of energy to be angry all the time and to hold grudges and resentments. It's exhausting. Uh, and one of the things we know developmentally that many people in midlife, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in midlife proudly, um, is that people tr often will try to reflect on how to figure out how to forgive other people in the past who have hurt them. You might be like, what? I can't do that. They really hurt me. And they might have, could have even been trauma. And I'm not saying that we should excuse any kind of bad behavior, but often the only, I mean, it's always been said, you know, that old saying, the, uh, the idea is when we, um, uh, you know, in, uh, have resentment, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die, right? The only person who's hurting there is you. Uh, forgiving other people isn't condoning their behavior, uh, especially let's say they passed away. Uh, there's no way that you can suddenly uh, kind of have them say they're sorry and try to take responsibility for a bad behavior. Uh, and yet you're still angry and holding on to that. And that's hurting you in the process. And that's one big part of, of that experience. Just something to think about, maybe take to your therapist. So what is our ethical responsibility as citizens as we're closing in on wrapping up or as neighbors? Um, Slitsky said, asking this question, in light of pathological tribalism, we have to preserve our capacity to think critically and our freedom to act accordingly, especially under an atmosphere that threatens oppression and to help our individuals, families, and communities do the same. This particular charge is actually to therapists, but I would say it can be to neighbors and ordinary citizens right here in Haddon Township in South Jersey. So to review, problem is in tribalism. Uh, we desire human groupishness, a fundamental aspect of it to survive and flourish. The problem is excessive polarization and cultural biases. That is, our tribal psychology works against us when our polarization, us versus them, for those of you who are Dr. Seuss fans, the sneetches with stars upon theirs are those who don't have stars upon theirs. Um, and as that level lowers of polarization, tribes thrive. At higher levels, they become pathological and hurtful. We don't fully understand the forces that are driving us apart. We're complex people. Uh, you know, social polarization is really multi-systemic. It happens in, in your family. It happens inside. It happens in our community. It happens in our work. It happens in our state, our nation, our world in lots of different ways. Uh, and most folks who say they understand it only look at it from one lens. Yes, even those of us in the academy who make it our life's work to understand the human behavior and largely look at lots of causal factors that lie outside their behavior. There's a reason why someone wakes up one day and says, I'm gonna steal a car today. It's not just because they wanna get in your face or cause you difficulty or commit a crime. Uh, there are often values behind some of those things. Be intentional about the tribes we join. Often we want to be aware and use our critical thinking skills to reflect on what are the costs of joining up with this tribe? Uh, is it possible to support parts of that tribe's ideas, but not all of them? Of course it is uh, in that experience. Uh, De, um, uh, De La Puente says conformity may be individually rationally adaptive, but collectively it's disastrous. Uh, and that is an important thing to remember. 
And that brings us to a tool that I want to give you before we move into our case examples. And that is the six pillars of critical thinking. One is logic. That is, we have to understand what follows what. It's basically considered scaffolding. Got people have to start to learn how to walk before they can run. So walking starts before running, right? Logic, first step, second step, third step. Argumentation, how to persuade for good reasons. So people want to persuade people to think differently than they do for lots of good reasons. We see that every single day when we watch TV or see political advertisements, right? Uh, and people invoke lots of affect and uh, bias and cultural cognition in those. Rhetoric. That is the art and science of communication and persuasion more broadly. So people will present uh, commercials that are supposed to go back to tugging on the heartstrings or perhaps uh, a little bit of threat or fear. This is going to happen if you don't X, Y, and Z. Uh, background knowledge. Um, you can do research on that subject matter. Look at the history of it, where it came from, how it was created, and how those things are processed in our brains. Uh, a sense of creativity, openness and imagination of ways of being different. Your way isn't the only way of existing. One of the things I love about uh, being a professor is when I get to take students internationally and travel to another country. Uh, and, uh, and one of the wonderful parts of that is recognizing that for students' learnings is that Americans aren't necessarily the center of the universe, is that other countries, other cultures have different ways of being. And that's really great for liberal arts thinking to think differently about a broad set of ideas. And then attitudes and values, your own personal sense of what is true, uh, how you um, uh, address doubt and uncertainty, respect for others and personhood, rationality, community, etc. And for those of you who are visual learners, uh, this is actually um, six uh, pillars of critical thinking. There's an error there, but you can see that those things kind of influence each other in that way uh, in this regard. And I think it's a, a good way to do some reflection. Now this requires more than anything when people encounter people who are different from them or a culture war stimulation of some kind to stop and take a breath. And rather than immediately engage in the pathological tribal thinking and reacting, stop and take a breath uh, as part of it and imagine yourself processing some of these things and think about doing some research. I tell my students, they got a supercomputer in their hand. Google it, uh, uh, look it up and see what people say using your critical thinking online uh, and uh, do so uh, wisely. So I wanna give you a case example. Uh, before I open it up for questions, a couple of them. Uh, this is Steve and Mark are a gay couple who've been together for 15 years. They're a very politically progressive couple and regularly advocate social justice issues left of center. Steve's brother, Jordan, and his wife, Lisa, are a conservative Christian couple who have also been together for a long time with multiple children. Similarly, they are politically active in conservative evangelical organizations for right of center causes. Sets the stage, right? For years, the couples occasionally sparred at holiday dinners over political hot potatoes, including Jordan and Lisa insisting that Steve and Mark not show any affection around the children. This was many years ago, and couples have discussed it and put it behind them uh, in the interests of family, which lots of people do. Um, recently, the fast food chain Chick-fil-A was identified as having donated large sums of money to organizations that espouse homophobic practices like reparative therapy, uh, therapists who say they can change a person's sexual orientation, uh, terminating LGBTQ employees, etc. Uh, at a recent family event, Lisa arrived with a Chick-fil-A meal. Mark casually mentioned to Lisa that Chick-fil-A engaged in supporting such hate groups. She immediately reacted and it turned into a hostile discussion escalating into a yelling match and they haven't talked to each other for five years. The emotional cutoff, right? Uh, quick hyper reactivity on all parts. So I'd like for you to think, what's your reaction to this? It might be similar, it might be familiar to some of you, might not. Um, if we looked at pathological tribalism, do we see cognitive biases there? What about the degree of polarization in the environment in which we currently live? What are some of the effects that you noticed? Reactive devaluation, crystallization, freezing people in time, othering, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and how might any of the, excuse me, six pillars influence your logic, argumentation, rhetoric, creativity, et cetera. Uh, if you were a member of this family, how would you handle it? What would you do? 
Um, were you drawn to one side or the other? Why was that? And how might you apply this kind of thought process in the future? Let me give you one more. A Tale of Two Griefs. Jasmine and Russell are an African-American couple, married couple who've been together for about 20 years. They live in Philly. They have two children, Russell Jr., 15, and Shanice, age 12. Recently, Russell was pulled over by a white police officer. Russell was not speeding or breaking any laws from what he could tell. He received a ticket and was referred to as a boy by the officer. In talking about this at the dinner table, Jasmine again reiterated how, my, how they must act if they're ever pulled over by a police officer. Russell Jr., exasperated, shoved his chair back from the table and stomped off. Jasmine's worried because he's having difficulty at school with one particular white social studies teacher, Mrs. Johnson. Russell Jr. says Mrs. Johnson regularly calls him a thug. Mrs. Teresa Johnson, a social studies teacher in Philadelphia School District, has been teaching there for over a decade. Her son was a police officer. He was killed in the line of duty two years ago. He was sitting in a patrol car alone when the suspect walked up and shot him. Later that day, the news reported that a white police officer shot by an unarmed black man who was running away in a Midwest city. Protests are now underway in that city. Mrs. Johnson started her social studies class with a casual comment about how shame how those thugs are burning down our country. Russell Jr. swore at her and ran out of the room. Pretty contemporary example. Again, what are your reactions to this scenario? Do you see aspects of pathological tribalism here? What are some of the effects that you noticed? In particular, the fact uh, where I gave at least a little bit of background on people's different perspectives. Um, how might you define or uh, see any of the pillars influence you here? If you were a member of either family, how would you handle it? Were you drawn to one side or the other and why? And how might you apply this kind of thinking in the future? So some takeaways uh, before I open it up for questions. Um, do good, do good. Uh, if you don't know what that means, because people, and I often will say, re be respectful of each other. People have a hard time knowing what that means, but boy, they know what disrespect feels like, right? Rolling of the eyes, sucking of the teeth, who knows what. If you don't know how to do good, just don't do any harm. Fairness, the rules exist for a reason. We try to function as best as possible in a subjectively fair cultures. And those are different for often for different people. And that's important to recognize is that not everyone is going to see fairness the way that you do. Um, think critically, self-reflect and self-correct. That is one of the mantras of my field of social work is self-reflect and self-correct. Is that we have to immediately engage in that critical thinking process to be like, I wonder where those people are coming from. I wonder what it would be like to live in their shoes for a day. I wonder what it would be like if I was a mouse and in their house watching an interchange between them and their family members, what would I see uh, in that experience? Perspective taking, critical thinking. Um, perspective taking, seeking common ground, uh, educating yourself, reading, research and reflect uh, you know, as part of that experience. We don't pay other people who aren't our teachers to educate us, right? We have to do that and have the ability to do that here. There's so many great books out there on anything and everything uh, from your tribe and from other tribal perspectives. Get involved, vote, register to vote. Yesterday was National Voter Registration Day. If you're not registered to vote, please vote and participate in the political process at the local, state, uh, regional and national levels and engage in service uh, as part of it. And uh, that's whether it be being a poll worker or making calls for your favorite candidate, uh, participate in that experience with an open mind. And humanity, we value it that we're all in many ways just muddling through. I mean, it's 2020, <laughs> come on, we have to muddle through. Um, these are my references and I'm happy to make some of these things available to you. And I wanna end before we open up questions, uh, my recently passed uh, mother-in-law who was a gem of a person uh, and as an angel um, used to say, if you can be kind, why not? Thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. I'm sure everybody is clapping at home right now. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate um, 
you know, the information that you have to offer. I was thinking to myself, wouldn't this be great if this was something that was offered um, as like a standalone course? in schools in of high course school. absolutely i think it would be a wonderful thing uh even just things on th uh, basics around negotiation communication discussion yeah. uh caring sharing all those kinds of things they yeah, do that kindergarten but we stop after that yeah yeah it seems to be the case well we have uh some questions for okay you from our padlet um okay all right, so this is a this is a long one, so I'll just read it out so everyone can. Okay. okay. Um, so this poster says, um, with gratitude to HEI and Dr. Satterley for facilitating this crucial crucial conversation. Our deeply ingrained individualist society rewards competition and consumption over cooperation, collaboration. Exceptionalism goes against our nature because human beings are social beings indelibly interconnected. We need each other to thrive. Many folks have taken up the mantle of self-reflection and responsibility to create change and to reimagine our social structures as equitable and just. Yet too many of us are content with the status quo, unwilling to experience the discomfort and ugliness that comes up in ourselves when we go beyond the surface to a deeper level of understanding, empathy, and acknowledgement of each other as humans and our innate ability for transformation. Every one of us wants and deserves to feel safe, be healthy and happy, have enough food to eat, and to live with ease. Cultivating these commonalities beyond our tribes seems to be out of reach. So here's the question. How can we fight for justice and equity and at the same time encourage those around us who can't yet see that courageously facing our fears and joining in for the greater good will free us all from the collective burdens of a white supremacist, capitalist, misogynist system built on violence and suppression. Thank you. Woo. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks all. I appreciate you coming. I'll see you later. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that's a really powerful question. Um, and I think the piece that I wanna highlight there is how do you go about fighting for, for justice? Um, and uh, you know the challenge is, is that Justin is often perceived according to this, right? And how we understand it and experience what is just and unjust. Uh, there are lots of different um, there are lots of different definitions of certain things. Diversity basically reflects uh, the term diversity reflects that there's lots of different ways of being in in a, in, uh, in this experience, not just one, right? <clears throat> uh, whereas equity is the adjustment of um, you know, oppression and privilege so that no one uh, is prohibited access to goods, services, resources, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, inclusion has to do with making sure that all voices are heard, right? And I've often thought of as using what's the DEI framework, that is diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is an important uh, way to go about having important conversations volunteer for organizations that you care passionately about. And as much as you want to, you can't control other people. Like you can't control other people. You can't control what they think, what they say, what they do, who they're gonna vote for, any of that kind of stuff. But pathological tribalism says that we, uh, you know, that, um, it, that it's, uh, that you can't engage in critical thinking. And what I would say is think, think, think that stop and think, uh, and that intellectualism isn't the answer here, but stopping, taking a breath and thinking about what it is you believe and how you believe it is really important. Having said all that, I wanna acknowledge, and I don't have a problem being transparent about it, is that I believe in the reality of uh, systemic and historical oppression uh, in our country, uh, and that in many ways, our country was built on the backs of uh, people with black and brown skin. Uh, and that systemic racism is a real thing and that white supremacy is a real thing and uh, other forms of oppression are a real thing at a micro systemic level that as well as a macro systemic level. Micro system being like family and the people we live with mm -hmm. in our community, macro system being our culture and larger kind of institutions. Um, and just believing that automatically puts me in a tribe, right? And so, and for other people who have a different perspective, they might say, Okay, that I don't believe that I disagree. You lost me there, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and I know that in uh, my own lived experience of as someone growing up in a world that is different, um, uh, it, it 
automatically help makes me uh, look at things differently than other people, uh, as opposed to um, like someone who grew up who looks a lot like other people. Uh, and uh, just as an FYI, I'm, as I mentioned already, I'm, a, I'm an out gay man. I know, shocked, you're surprised, right? Uh, and uh, so, but the idea here is that, um, that, that uh, growing up in a straight world automatically gives me a different perspective, a different lens than someone who is straight, who grew up in that. And so I believe in those socio-historical realities uh, of that phenomena. Having said all of that as well, is that I genuinely believe that, for example, people who are on a different side of the political aisle than me truly, truly believe what they believe for good reasons. Uh, you know, and that, uh, and, and I can't, I mean, I grew up in North Central Pennsylvania and some of the folks, I remember asking myself the question, uh, how could a reasonable person vote for Donald Trump? And, uh, and then asking myself the same question, how could a reasonable person vote for Hillary Clinton? Uh, and so weighing that kind of discourse uh, is an important piece of critical thinking that is really valuable. And regardless of what, I'm not saying this is what the answers are. I'm just saying, ask yourself those questions uh, and where, you, where those answers come up for you. And if you feel like you don't know enough about it, go back to the six pillars and start doing some research, doing some homework. Uh, it is not, the responsibility of people in different tribes to educate you. Uh, it's yours. So it sounds like sort of starting that, starting the task of thinking about your own thinking is the first step Absolutely. in trying to support um, people in opening their, you know, kind of like making, like I said before, community as open arms rather than closing in on each other. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the what we know is that when we build relationships with people who are different from us, that generally speaking, prejudicial beliefs decrease. It's called Al it's called contact theory mm -hmm. by Alport. Yeah. Uh, the, and that, that's the, because remember, we go back to crystallization, right? We have a bad experience with someone who's a representation of another group, like, um, like a, a black person or someone who's Latino or a gay person or a woman or a man. And we, it's, we just make generalization and sweeping beliefs about that entire group uh, as opposed to to, um, uh, you know, not thinking about that was just one experience. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, thinking about your own thinking and feeling is really critical for this kind of work. And, and would you say it's fair that often those crystallization experiences are really emotionally charged? Yes. So, so recognizing often. that there's a lot of emotion tied into uh, freezing people where they're... Yeah, and, and often, and I'll just say, it's often in my experience as a clinician, it's often tied to trauma that people have had really negative or bad experiences in their life. We know the CDC put out an ACE study, mm -hmm. Adverse Childhood Experiences in 2015 and studied it and basically said, holy crow, like, so like two thirds of people reported, uh, you know, uh, having multiple adverse childhood experiences, which means right. things like childhood abuse, neglect, uh, grief, unresolved trauma, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're, we're pretty wounded as a people. Yeah, uh, And so it doesn't surprise me that that kind of othering and crystallization is about protecting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So here's a great question. Um, how can we educate teenagers to be mindful of polarizing posts on social media and how to appropriately, appropriately react to them? I'll let you know. <laughs> Uh, um, honestly, that's a really good question. And I would pose the same thing to adults. Yeah. Uh, I've seen like adults pose incred post incredibly hostile or inappropriate, whatever. Um, I guess part of it is uh, parents are parents and caregivers, are the number one educators of their children, whether they choose to be or not. That is, the, um, you know, contextual family therapy, uh, you know, it helps us understand that we communicate our values and ways of being to our kids and to young people in general, not just by saying words, but don't, don't do this or do this, but how we act, what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. Your children are sponges. They watch, they learn, they soak up that stuff. Uh, and they're influenced by their peer group, by their generation, by the technology aspects of it. Um, right. The best bet is to have developmentally appropriate and informed and educated conversations with your kids in an ongoing manner. And that's about 
everything. That's about relationships, drugs and alcohol, sex, uh, risk behaviors, all those kinds of things from when you're very young. We know the research reinforces that time and time again, that if people have people who care about their kids, have developmentally appropriate conversations and communicate that they are gonna be there for them, that they have unconditional positive regard, which basically says they're gonna love them no matter what. And they reinforce that they're not going anywhere and they're reliable, those kids turn out okay. Sure, they're gonna be kids and do stupid stuff. I mean, kids do, right? It's just nowadays that stuff is public and it's got a huge megaphone called social media. Right. Uh, and so, which can be really damaging. And we've seen that like damage people. Uh, and so trying to have ongoing conversations with kids uh, in a way, and a great recommendation, have them in your car because kids are trapped <laughs> and they're facing forward, not looking at you uh, and they're short. Uh, and so, and make, it's not one and done. It's these ongoing developmental conversations about good behavior. Yeah. Uh, like, and I always say to parents and caregivers, like, I'm assuming that you want to have conversations about your values with your children, because I can guarantee you other people already are. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like um, with teenagers, because they're getting kind of these insidious messages through social media, like these yep. uh, subtle, it's subtle humor that's offensive and they don't, they don't recognize that. Um, just kind of responding versus reacting, like you don't want to shame teens um, you know, have them feel bad about thinking something is funny, but really engage them in a conversation about, you know, what are the issues with why that's not funny. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and it's also recognizing reactivity will just drive it all underground. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we know when, you know, like, for example, when um, children disclose <clears throat> trauma of any kind, uh, you know, to parents or caregivers, and a parent understandably reacts or freaks out, right? Oh, my God! is that that what happens is the kid or the teen even ingests or sees that their parents or caregivers are freaking out and all of a sudden the sense is I've done something wrong and it actually makes recovery from that trauma harder uh, now that's an extreme example but I would say the same is true of just bad behavior yeah. uh, as soon as there's hyper reactivity either the kid will be like oh wow shame guilt or you know what? I'm not even going to share this with them. I'm going to block them. They're not going to see anything. It's all going to go underground. And there goes your avenue uh, to, um, you know, being able to uh, have developmentally appropriate conversations. You know, so if you know, here and you have to often choose which battles you want to fight. Like, is this the hill I really want to die on? You know, is like to clean, make sure my kid cleans their room you know, or, or who they're dating, that kind of stuff. Like, is that okay? Is that not okay? Often my recommendation in that is come up with a series of just a, a handful of critical rules. If there, I need to know where you are. Uh, if you're in danger and, or you're drinking or something, call me and I'll come pick you up. I don't care where you are. Those kinds of really essential rules versus make sure your room is spotless. Uh, and that's a little bit further from like, but it still could be bad behavior, right? right. And so that's a big part of it. So um, incorporating that critical thinking lens and maintaining your value system is yep. essential. Yep. And often what we know right. is that children generally adopt the same values as their parents. That's what we know. You're so Not right. always, but generally. Um, what anti-tribalist actions can community members take? Oh, wow. Um, so th this question, uh, there's a thank you in here also. Oh, sure. Um, but like, what are some ideas for community events or actions that can diffuse tribalism in one's own town? Well, um, I have, uh, <laughs> I've been in part, I've been uh, participated at times in some of the things called common ground initiatives, uh, where people from uh, very disparate points of view get together to, uh, and agree to a series of guidelines and try to deter and have conversations about things. Um, there are some, you know, uh, I believe there's a, a number of different, uh, probably um, on Netflix, a number of different uh, kind of groups or shows where there's where you've seen or news uh you know shows where people have sat down uh from very different points of view and tried to have conversations and understand each other and that can be really difficult um and very hard i remember i was i participated uh in um something called the national consensus project years ago by surgeon general um a, you know 
uh, David Thatcher and uh, where very disparate uh, groups politically. So Focus on the Family sat down with Planned Parenthood to have conversations. Uh, boy, that was fun. Uh, and I remember, you know, um, that, that, that people become very reactive about those kinds of things. And in small groups, I was uh, paired up with a gentleman from Focus on the Family. And uh, and he said, so you're with Widener. And I said, yeah. And I said, you're with Focus on the Family. And so we started talking and I said, listen, you know, the all this national conversation is one thing, but really where change happens is at the local level. Um, so, and he was from South Jersey and I said, why don't you come to my house and have dinner with my husband and I you can feel free to bring your family if you want and we can talk and just talk and he said I think that's the first time a gay man's ever invited me over to your house and I said that you know of uh, and uh, and he uh, and I learned later that he couldn't come because he was fired uh, and the reality of it is is that when you're part of tribes that have that have that degree of pathological tribalism uh, is that even the possibility of looking at different ways of being can be frightening and be resulted in, in punitive outcomes. And I share that story not to bash focus on the family or anything like that. People have very different points of view and belonging to those different um, realities. I'm just telling you my lived experience, but I will say having conversations with people from different points of view is hard and critical. Uh, we're all living in the same community, right? Uh, and and that is something that I'm committed to and participating in that kind of process. Um, and my guess is at the end of the day, we could identify some common values like people care for their families. They want what's best for their families. They want, you know, good things in their life. They want to make sure their families are safe and well cared for and the opportunities for their kids to grow and thrive and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so having community oriented events to that effect, I think can be really positive. Something like a, um, a book club. Uh, you know, that, that has people from different points of view uh, with maybe an agreement to like have civil conversations, uh, you know, something as simple as that, but the sky's the limit uh, with regard to what you can do uh, in that experience, even just getting together with a couple of friends and trying to figure out how and having conversations about some of the culture wars and uh, about that kind of come up as hot topics in your family and brainstorming what are some good ways that I could approach my family with this because people just go crazy you know and that kind of stuff and yeah. that's exhausting yeah and there's lots of neutral events in town that people can participate in of course. Like, as long as you know make the effort to connect with people who are different yeah. people, just to get that you know that relationship started is a good yeah. Absolutely. I mean, anything like just, just the farmer's markets, you know, in our immediate yeah. areas are wonderful community events. Um, what are three things you hope everyone here takes away from your presentation tonight? Ooh, um, <clears throat> breathe. Think. And speak your truth, even if your voice shakes. Fear is a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I might add a fourth. Um, the people from whom you may be emotionally cut off won't always be here. And the question I often have for folks is, it, certainly I've asked this question as a, th as a therapist is, you know, do you want to have healing with them? Do you need them to be able to have healing with them? Do you want to have a relationship with them? Why or why not? It's lots of folks I've worked with don't even remember why they are emotionally cut off from people, you know, from 15 years ago. It's a real tragedy. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, I think, you know, I appreciate the uh, homage to RBG. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I think also, you know, like as as we can begin to recognize how emotionally charged some of these things are and really apply some of the critical thinking skills that you're talking about, that's really a tool that we can start to heal ourselves first so that we can reconnect with people that we have had challenges with. Yeah. So I think that's a great, if we, I might have to get that from you so that we can share it out to all the viewers so they can kind of take a look at that and chew on it. Yeah. At home. 
people's personal pain keeps them disconnected from other folks. Uh, and, uh, and it's so uh, honestly, things that, uh, you know, pathological tribes thrive on personal pain. Like uh, they just, they, they feed on it. Uh, and it's so easy to see other people as the enemy, as evil and, uh, and that kind of thing. And that's, that's really painful. I think that's a really powerful statement that pathological tribes uh, thrive on personal pain. Yeah, it so does. Kind of keeping that um, kind of at the forefront of your mind really is another way to really reflect on how you think and how you see other people. And what's the, what's the core of that? Yeah. And it's, um, this world can be a lonely place if you don't have folks in your life, right? And I think we've especially learned that during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And, sure. uh, nothing if just like hugging my loved ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah. one of those things. Um. All right. So here's this is a this is a, a this is a, this could be a challenging question because this really speaks to um, people's experience around really polar. Um, polar opposite views and how, how people view other people's um, positions on particular issues. So this question is, do you have suggestions for respectively, respectfully engaging with people who choose to ignore facts and critical thinking practices, but embrace conspiracy theories and damaging behaviors that are detrimental to our shared community? <laughs> That's the $6 billion question, right? <laughs> um, so one of the things that is challenging when I teach uh, and train, I don't expect that I'm going to be able to reach people on the extremes. I just don't, uh, you know, I think generally, and when I'm interacting with someone, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be, uh, you know, in a classroom, whether it be uh, in a, a symposium like this, what have you, is that people will often, uh, that I, I can speak with that person with extreme views and all the other people from all up and down that ideological spectrum are watching me and they're listening and paying attention and drawing conclusions and engaging in critical thinking. I can't control other people. And that idea, and I'm not always right, shocker, right? And I'm not, uh, you know, and I'm not, Oh, and I don't have to have it perfect. Uh, I am a lifelong learner and that is quite freeing that I don't have to have it perfect. And then I'm gonna fall flat on my face and mess up and hurt people probably by language I use, things I do or say, uh, and that that is in and of itself painful and I have to take responsibility for that, which I try to do. Uh, I will say that one of the hardest parts uh, of this is when your own buttons are pushed and you feel like, but I have the science, I have the facts to back it up. And one of the scary parts of, uh, of our world today is um, people often don't trust um, what uh, the media is saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, the mechanism of, quote, fake news and uh, short circuits, a sense of trust in various media out outlooks. And what we have then is cognitive biases will say, OK, this particular network always speaks the truth and this one never does. Uh, and the reality of it is, is that neither of those are true. Uh, and uh, and we have to be able to engage in critical thinking just uh, because someone is going to ignore um, facts or what have you, oftentimes what's happening is that chances are they've thought about those things, but right now they just want to razz you. They want to get a rise out of you. They want to see you get frustrated or upset or emotional or what have you. Uh, and I'm not attributing negative motivation motives to that person, but that might be what some of their ego needs are in the moment. Uh, that is what, that's what they want to see happen. Uh, 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 put, I mean, that's what motivates, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, road rage, like right? punishment. I want to punish other people, uh, you know, and the same thing is true because, and that again comes from somewhere. People don't just wake up and say, oh, I'm going to razz a conservative or a liberal today, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, at least I hope not. Uh, but there's a reason for that because of often their own pain. They're all woundedness because it's much easier to be mad than sad. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's a part of that process. Uh, and so I usually look at that person who's lashing out and in my clinical head, what often helps me is saying, how old is that person right now? How old are they acting? Are they acting 30? Are they acting 12? 
are they acting five? Uh, and it helps me frame them developmentally based on that particular perspective. When you talk to somebody who's gonna ignore like that the sky is blue, that's what we would call a concrete thinker. That happens in cognitive thinking, cognitive theory, when someone is like a, a middle child. Uh, and so being able to frame them in that sense and watch everyone else watch me, it's a great way to release my own buttons and not get, if you will, activated by somebody's kind of going at me. Does that make sense? So it's, well, first of all, people are so complex. So knowing that the behavior that you see externally is probably driven by a whole host of life experience, values and yep. memories that they have no, um, they have no awareness of, no conscious awareness of. Completely. Yeah. And knowledge, knowing that knowledge doesn't influence behavior, we can give all the facts and figures that we want. And if somebody's operating from a place of, you know, really protecting those values, like that infant, um, that information is not going to change their perspective. Exactly. And people yeah. can literally close off their mind with what we call a shade, like a cognitive shade, you know, and it can be anything from their belief system to their values, even to their faith. Like it's because my higher power, God, or, you know, uh, Muhammad or whomever says so. Mm -hmm. And what do you say to that? All right? right. People have different values and beliefs uh, in that experience. Yeah. So, so energy spent is probably, um, you know, people that will engage you in a conversation and not engage in those cognitive shades yes or you know kind of cutting you off so <clears throat> and after you have some of those experiences it's not a bad thing to go into an echo chamber and have some self-care right <laughs> go find people that you care about and care about you and have a nice hot cup of tea and you know a chocolate sundae or or, or do something like get a massage or go for a, a walk or a run or something that is good for you right <laughs> you process some of those things. Yeah. So like recognizing your own like physical responses to some of these charged conversations is really important so that yeah. you can kind of maintain yourself in a space where you can, um, you know, respond to things more than react because, you know, anybody is subject to that reactive behavior. Absolutely. And it, ha it happens. And maybe you didn't sleep well last night and you got up this morning and you spilled coffee down your front and you're late for a meeting and mm -hmm. your kid got, you know, got in trouble at school. Who knows what? And, right. you know, and, and so you end up lashing out. That, that's natural. It happens. Yeah. Right. And but it also there's really great tools ground any good therapist like will be grounded grounding tools, you know, just deep breathing, the kind of uh you know, seven breath or seven count in, inhale, right. hold it for seven seconds and then exhale it for seven seconds. Just yeah. something like that immediately triggers neurobiological responses to calm you down uh, in that experience. Something as simple as breathing, thinking and speak your truth. So everybody, uh, I think that's a very important takeaway. It goes back to what you said with breathing is, is to have something in your toolbox that you can address some of your own, you know, you can address and take care of your own state when you come into these charged situations. That's Absolutely. essential. Absolutely. And I, th I think it's particularly significant for people who are directly impacted by the content of the conversation. So for example, if you're having a conversation about um, the realities of racism uh, with uh, people who are uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, like their affect, their emotional experience of those conversations is often so heightened or intense than a white person's, right? Uh, and to recognize, and so for people, black indigenous people of color, it's really important to learn those skill sets, to care for themselves, to recognize their own self-esteem, their own self-worth, and when they do or don't want to engage in those kinds of conversations. Right. It's one of the reasons why it's important to be able to have uh, people who stand in solidarity with you to support you uh, in that experience. Yeah. So, and choosing not to engage in those conversations is a perfectly fine thing to do also. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like a choir. Like everybody can't all be singing 24 hours a day. Some people have to rest yes. while other people sing. And right. it's kind of like, that's a big part of the way that this kind of social justice advocacy work works yeah. uh, because people have to care for themselves. So um, question about holidays. Um, <laughs> How do you introduce folks from uh, across the political spectrum to this topic at a Thanksgiving dinner table? 
<laughs> well, some people often have a rule like there's no politics discussion or no religion or anything like that. If it works for them, it works for them. I often will, um, I, I think it's good to have those kinds of conversations as long as they are not, um, if they don't turn abusive. And sometimes they turn abusive and that, that's not, you know, that's love is not abuse, abuse is not love. Uh, and so the idea in that experience is to recognize um, what uh, one is saying and how they're saying it. Uh, and because people need practice with how to have difficult conversations with people who care about them, right? And that, that other people, hopefully those people won't intentionally try to hurt you but they might not understand. Remember the idea here is people wanna be seen, heard, and known. What would you need to feel that way at a conversation like that at a Thanksgiving dinner uh, and uh, in that experience? And it, might, and it doesn't always have to be doom and gloom. It might be, I'm really thankful to be able to be here with people that I love and care about. And if like in a pandemic, I think that's a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> and, uh, but you might also talk differently about um, you know, healthcare, uh, right. you have different perspectives on the second amendment, you might have to, uh, you know, or, or what defunding the police looks like, or who knows what, right. uh, and those things could be really charged. So it sounds like, um, it makes sense for people to have opportunities to practice these yes. skills. Um, so when you go to the dinner table, you can't expect just because you have a new set of skills or you're working on a way <laughs> of being that your other, uh, family members will be there with you you know, in the same place at the same time. Yeah, bing, bing. I mean, I can tell you that when I was in social work school, one of the, the general rules was don't social work your family. <laughs> don't ever, <laughs> ever use your powers for evil, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that is a really important thing. Um, just because you're having an experience and doing your own personal work doesn't mean anybody in your family is doing the same thing. Right. Uh, you know, it does mean you might talk about that process and what that's like. But you also need to be prepared for other people to dismiss it, to poo-poo it, to shame it, you know, who knows what. Yeah. Um, and deciding for yourself if that's the case. I usually go back to the first, uh, like the second slide that I showed here, which was the kindergarten ground rules, <laughs> which I find is really, really important for family members to be able to discuss such things. It sounds like that's something maybe we should send out to all of our families. Absolutely. A Thanksgiving basket full yeah. of ground rules. Yes. Um, let's see. How do you, this is a great question. How do you balance respecting differences while staying true to your own values? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, and uh, I, I can certainly respect differences, but I also recognize what I deem as unacceptable. Uh, you know, what I deem is like, for me, racism is unacceptable. For me, um, you know, getting fired because you're LGBTQ is unacceptable. Um, I mean, those kinds of things. I can respect a person's right to have those beliefs as long as those beliefs don't impact my well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't like those beliefs, but they exist in the world. And if I'm going to play well in the sandbox with others, I have to figure out how to navigate some of that stuff. And it might mean limiting how much I'm around those folks or in those situations, if possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, I also know that um, people, again, are who they are for a reason. People are grown up and reared and taught uh, from a legacy point of view, ways of being and what's right and what's wrong. And uh, if I think that what they believe is wrong, they might think what I believe is wrong um, right. and uh, that kind of thing. I, and I, I struggle with, uh, I think most folks do with uh, the experience of not tolerating intolerance. Uh, and I generally don't like the word tolerance. Like, well, I can, I can put up with you in spite of like, oh, you smell a little bit, but I'll put up with you. Um, but I think in this instance, it is an accurate uh, uh, frame, uh, if you will, to use that uh, idea of what it means to tolerate intoler or not tolerate intolerance uh, in that process. And also kind of connecting that to contact theory, it, it takes repeated experiences with people with different views to consider other points of view also. Yes. So it's not gonna be a magical experience where um, values and beliefs are changed by virtue of one interaction. 
Yeah, wow. it's actually similar to cognitive biases. One of the major ways that people shift and change their own ideas and values is around building relationships with people who are different from them and then having cognitive and affective dissonance. Dissonance being like this unusual kind of imbalance. It, it rubs the wrong way. It's like two keys on a piano that don't seem to go together. Uh, and it's that sense of like, well, you don't fit into what I thought about this group of people. How is that the case? And I love you and I care about you and I want what's best for you. And, and so I have to re-examine what I believe. And that can be really, really scary for people because those beliefs are often taught and cherished. Remember infants values. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be really frightening because it often can feel like almost a domino effect. Right. If one person starts questioning this, pe this particular belief, then their whole worldview is gonna crumble. And that's terrifying. Right. Uh, we cannot under it. Like that is real scary for lots of people. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why people run away from critical thinking is because it feels like it's going to shatter their whole world. Right. And that the, and there's that discomfort of wanting, wanting to change, but also feeling like this foundational beliefs are at stake. Yes. Um, so, you know, feeling like you have to make a choice between who, who I was versus who I can be. Yes. That's very uncomfortable. For Absolutely. Sure. Uh, that kind of discomfort is often in, it's like when you exercise and your muscles hurt. Yeah, that's what it is. Your muscles are like, ow, they torn a little bit and I got to heal. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we have a lot of questions about how to engage family members and how to have these conversations. So it sounds to me like, um, there's certainly more work to be done on our end in providing information um, to our members in the community at large on how to have challenging conversations, how to use those critical thinking skills and still speak to your values. Absolutely. Um, so um, I know that our, our time is coming to an end right now, um, but there's lots of requests for resources or recommendations. So, um, you know, I'm sure you and I will talk after this and we'll be yeah. able to collect some resources and share them with the community. And, you know, maybe we can circle back to this topic in some, some way again. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's so many resources and it completely yeah. depends a lot on what areas you want to explore. Uh, I mean, for every single culture war that I talked about, there are resources, uh, you know, so it's, it completely varies. Uh, and there are resources written from multiple points of view. I don't recommend just sticking with one point of view. I often will watch, um, you know, different political, <laughs> ideological channels for news uh, and uh, use my own critical thinking skills to look at them. I mean, I think that's a healthy experiment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I think next steps for us, uh, for people watching, we will uh, get together a resource list. Um, if you have questions after this that come up, please uh, pass them along and we'll see if we can get them answered um, as best as we can. Uh, Brent, I really want to thank you. Um, I'm so happy that you volunteered your time and expertise at this conversation. Uh, I think it's so important and it's really, the, it's the basis and the core for change in our communities. Um, once we can start really thinking about ourselves and how we exist and how we um, move through the world, um, you know, those are the, those are the challenging steps that we need to take to make sure that we're creating a space that everybody can feel comfortable um, you know, like the Haddon Township motto where community can thrive, but for everyone. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, It's my pleasure to, to have been here. Thank you so much for asking. And, uh, you know, I think if, uh, if something I said tonight uh, offended you or upset you, uh, you know, I, certainly I apologize. I also know it's good sometimes to look at where you were offended and upset because that can give you an idea of things you want to take a look at and just weigh for yourself uh, and uh, recognize where that comes from. What was that about? Is that what values there? Do I want to affirm or change it? Uh, and that kind of stuff. It's, it's a good self-reflect and self-correct kind of experience mm -hmm. um, and recognize that maybe what's under the, there has to do with some personal feelings. Uh, and that's, that's important. You're allowed to be human uh, and nobody's perfect. Um, and we will be also just as an FYI, a little uh, PSA, we're doing our Halloween decorations this year, even though hey! we're going to we're gonna have trick or treating, but we'll have <laughs> the up so people can see things. And, uh, uh, but other than that, mischief managed. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Bye.